All right, Joe, fresh from uh, Sydney, Australia. We're sitting down here this morning and uh, yeah, you know, like we were just discussing, you know, we're gonna just do like what I do with everybody and go go A to Z. You know, you were born and now we're here speaking right now and I know nothing about you. We've never talked to before. Kind of fill me in with some history so we can all build some backstory with you because once we get to where we're at now and you know, like just with the message that you're putting out to the world right now, I, I wanna build the story up into why that became um, a message that you connect with so much. So um, welcome to the show. Thanks, Blake. Thanks for having me. It's uh, 5 a.m. in Sydney this morning, and it's pretty standard for me to be up this time, so it feels like a normal morning. Yeah. So you're an early riser, like that. that's typical to your nature. Like, what time do you usually get up every day? Yeah, I'm more often than not a 5 a.m. starter, but sometimes if I have something bigger to do, it's, it's slightly earlier, depending on what's going on for the day. Yeah. Have you always been that way? Like, were, were you born and raised, you know, valuing waking up earlier? Or is it something that you adopted later on in life? A mixture of both. When I was a kid, my dad used to get these whole uh, health bursts and he used to get me up at dawn and take me running. So he had somebody to go with and being the youngest in the family, I was the one that was going to be the least resistant to it. So I was always the one that he chose but it wasn't really something that I, I firmly instilled in myself until later on in life. I could very easily go from the I'm up at 5 a.m. to the I can sleep until 9. But I was never one of those people that could get past, you know, 8.30 or 9 in the morning and, and continue to sleep. It was always, oh, no, the day started. I need to get up. I need to do something. I can't just stay in bed. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that there's such like a breeze? Because like I'm the same way and I know that there's a, there's a huge pool of us that like when you wake up, you're just kind of ready to go. Like, do you think that's just in our genes? Do you think we learned that? Is that like, like, how do you think we come by that? Honestly, it's a really interesting question. Actually, I have an eight year old boy and he's always been an early riser. I talk to all my friends who have got boys and they all say, yeah, boys are early risers, boys are early risers. And I do wonder if there's a certain element of genetics there. Uh, I struggled with him initially trying to get him to sleep longer because I thought that he wasn't getting enough sleep and then soon realized that the reason he was up is because his body was saying, that's it, I've had enough. So from a genetic perspective, I do actually wonder if, if whether or not it can actually be ingrained in you to some extent. Mm -hmm. I know in his case, once he's up, he's up. So for me, I taught myself later on in life that there was a benefit to being up at 5 a.m. took me a little bit of time to get to that point, but I found that once I had a reason to be up at five, it was never a question. I'm just awake. You know, and I think like you just kind of alluded to like a few different things there. Like for one, when we have purpose, like it's easy, but I think it, like if we have a transient nature to our day, like there's, there's not a lot of reason to give. So like it's easier for people if they're inherently a little bit more like I want to sleep in. It's easier to do that if there's not a need to be able to get up and start your day. But for two, I think that we all we've created a lot of these like like social standards in a lot of different categories and if we don't meet up to them it creates like anxious parenting and especially because i know like with my kids i have three kids eight four and two and they all sleep differently you know like my oldest she loves waking up early like she sleeps like a, a decent amount of hours but like she just she really likes waking up early and i used to stress out too about the you know she's not getting like the 12 hours or the 14 hours of sleep but then I realized, well, diet's not that way, exercise not that way, you know, like work's not that way. Like, why would we treat sleep like everybody has to have the same amount of sleep when there's so many different personalities and so many different body types out there? That's such a good point. And I find with sleep, typically people don't get enough because we're trying to push too much into our day, but also some of the habits that we've instilled in our day of screen time and um, social media, for instance, TV watching, Netflix binging, it, it creates this environment where it's not conducive to sleep, but our circadian rhythms are what they are. So when we tap into the way we're actually meant to be personally, as opposed to generically, then it's different for everyone. I know personally for me, I used to have a really strict routine of bed at 9.30, up at five. And I was really, really strict about that. But then in some of the research that I did, I learned to start managing my life by my energy and less by the clock. Yeah. So what that means for me sometimes is I'm up till 1am and I'm still awake at five and I'm perfectly fine. 
but I know what my limits are on that to avoid being burned out. So whereas once upon a time, I would continually push to that because there was always plenty to do and I'd find myself in a position where I'd get immensely fatigued and eventually got quite burned out. Now I'm more in touch with what's going on with me and I know the signs of, okay, you need to rest now, you need to have decent sleep now. And sometimes it is 9.30 and I switch off and I get some decent sleep. Other times it's early a.m. But the key I've found for me is to be able to manage my energy, not manage my clock. And then bringing meditation into that to bookend my day has also allowed me to be able to maximise my energy and understand better the energy shifts and the type of person I am with my circadian rhythms, with my my analytical side, with my creative side, when I flow better during the day and how to understand that personally and then get other people to understand that in them. Yeah, see, and you you just brought something I think is like a love great value that not enough people talk about. So like you talked about like either getting like this, you know, maybe like eight hours of sleep versus this four hours of sleep or the kind of like anything in between, like you, you listen to your body. So like one of the things that I struggle with when I'm talking to people specifically about sleep is, you know, if you compare me and then, you know, say maybe like another guy who, you know, maybe works construction 10 or 12 hours a day, you know, maybe pounds back a six pack, you know, smokes or like, you know, has McDonald's on me. I'm like, just all these kind of things. It's hard to believe that him and I, you know, because I live like a very kind of similar lifestyle, you know, like meditation practice, you know, during the day, you know, like I eat, you know, very like holistically. It would be very odd to me to think that like we both um, would need the same amount of sleep in like in our nighttime because we're just doing a lot. Our bodies are performing a lot different actions at night while we're sleeping. Now, yeah. so like, and I kind of took it a little bit further because I actually tracked my sleep for months because I actually thought the same thing as you. Well, I'm, I've been told I need this amount of sleep, but my body actually doesn't feel like I need this amount of sleep. So am I lying to myself thinking I can reduce my sleep and still function? But I'm like, I've been doing this my entire life. I've been doing this for like 36 years. So there's obviously some part of like this that my body connects with, right? Yeah. I was like, okay, well, I'll sleep for six hours, kind of see how I feel, five hours, four hours. And I kind of played around with it. And about five hours of sleep a night really seems the best for me because as soon as I want to go to bed, I fall asleep instantly. I wake up and I'm ready to go. You know, like I feel like I've slept really hard. So like, and I, like I can function very highly all day long with that amount of sleep. And then when I did my 23 and me, if I found out that uh, my Delta waves are very high, which it puts me into like a deeper sleep faster and longer than normal people. So then again, there adds some like validity to that. But again, we all try to fit into like this little fishnet of like what we think is good for everybody you know so if you don't fall into that if you're not willing to do the research like what you did and like what i did just on ourselves like how much like sleep are we losing because we don't think we're getting enough sleep yeah absolutely i think you've touched on so many really good points there like and the number one thing i pick up from that is the five hours uh when i had my first daughter uh, she was a terrible sleeper i spent the first six months of her life trying to just cope she was one of those children that was constantly crying when she was awake. She was barely sleeping. So it was a really, really tough time. And one of the things I quickly worked out for me is if I get five hours solid, so long as I, work, I wake up in the a.m. of the next day, I'm yeah. fine. So it doesn't matter if it was 12.05. Yeah. I'm fine if I've gotten five hours solid. But if I woke up at 11.59 p.m. the night before, psychologically my mind would throw me even if i'd gotten five hours i hadn't gotten into the next day so for me that just completely annihilated the next day psychologically and my mind was shot but my my number one was five hours and i used to always aim for if i can just get five solid hours i know i can cope so i worked that out very very quickly so it was always the goal just i just need five hours i just need five hours and i knew that i could go for three solid days with bare minimum of five hours and it wouldn't impact me but then as soon as i started to get longer than that it would start to have an impact on my ability to be able to cope with her on a day to day what do you think it is about five hours just like on the research that you've done like like have you found out like any like valid reason because i actually know a very, very large percentage of high functioning individuals that sleep like 
about four and a half to five hours a night. And like that just, they think the same thing too. Like that just is like their meal ticket when it comes to sleeping. I haven't done any research to that extent with it, but you're quite right. I've come across quite a few people that are high performers. I, I think of a friend of mine who in his 30s went and did two PhDs. He was a father and, and held a job, but he managed to do two PhDs in 10 years. Really? And he was five hours sleeper. He says, if I have four to five hours sleep a night, I'm fine. And he was go for the other 19 hours for the day. He didn't stop and his mind was constant. But when he shut down, he shut down completely. So he had trained his mind so specifically that, okay, it's this time we're sleeping. And he'd he'd done that very well. Yeah. And I'm like that too. Like, like I can be like task orientated to like 10 59 but it, in my mind if i've known all day that 11 p.m i'm going to bed when that yeah. 11 comes down like my body like i can't even get to the bed but like my mind is so just well trained like and it can be any variation of time but like when i preconceived a time when i know i'm going to bed like it shuts me down like immediately it's, it's fantastic when you've got routine like that um when yeah. you're able to discipline your life like that it's very interesting though when you get yourself in a situation where that routine it has to align with other people in your life and it it can be very socially annihilating <laughs> when yeah. you're so disciplined with your time that oh i have to go i've got to go to sleep and you're out with your friends they're going are you kidding it's, yeah. we're, we're out we're having fun so no no I have to go to sleep now my body's about to literally shut down and yeah. I used to notice that when I used to have the 9 30 sleep I'd start to yawn around 9 15 because my mind is preparing and my body is preparing for sleep and my friends used to give me a hard time and say you're such a nanner it's 9 15 I'm like I'm tired I want to go home I want to sleep they're like no no push through push through yeah. and I'd be able to but I think that also helps to define the type of people that you socialize with then because you want to be around people that understand what's important to you or alternatively in my situation, because I find that I like to be able to be, get, to go out and be social at times and push past the limits of what I've established for myself sleep wise. I'll prepare myself mentally during the day and go, okay, so this particular night that's coming, it's going to be a big night. I'm going to be out with friends. I'm expected to stay out let's just go and do whatever it needs to be. And then I'll make plans for the next two days to catch up on what I know I'm going to lose. So so long as I go into that, knowing that this particular evening is going to be an investment. And over the next couple of nights after that, I've cleared some things out to catch myself up. Then I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is in the social part, I think is the key because I've not as noticed. I don't like for sleep, but it's, you know, diet, it's exercise, it's like professionally, it's, you know, personally in, in every regard, like it's amazing how much like these social factors really determine like our overall success. Cause like, I, I feel like I know enough now where I'm in tune with myself enough now that if kind of like one of my things is askew, it starts the crippling of the foundation. Like it might not be like the one, but like if there's too many of those pieces of my pie that are off, like we all feel it, like we know that. Right. And a lot of that, like I have found is strictly just comes back to like social situations and like, you know, like what we're doing with our day, who we're like spending our day with and how that influences us. Cause even if we think we're strong enough to be able to be that person in the group, like it'll chip away at us over time. Right. Mm. Absolutely. It definitely will. Uh, Try dating. Yeah. It's fun. Because you, uh, you work out what's really, really key for you and you start to set these standards of things that you need to align with what you do. Uh, I've found myself in situations where I may get along with someone and we start to have conversations about, so what sort of person are you? Are you the type of person that sleeps in? Are you an early riser? You know, what do you like to do with your day? And it's, oh, I like to sleep in and I like to watch Netflix. And, you know, my little mind's going off going, no, 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 this is bad. And yeah, so... I don't have <laughs> so you you kind of try to very nicely disengage from the conversation and I've, I've found a way to do it being graceful and, and um, not being rude about it but mm. just saying to the person you know I really respect the lifestyle that you've chosen to lead however it doesn't match with mine and I'm really looking for someone who who does what I do because mm. I know how difficult it can be when you're uh, you're unmatched in certain elements of your life which are key to your success and it does cause a certain amount of conflict and resistance. So that, from a social standpoint, uh, your friends that you're involved with and in my case in, in the dating, it's got to be about we're aligned on the key points that are really, really non-negotiables with me. Yeah. 
like what are like when you're looking at situations like what are like you know kind of keep it more like sky you don't have to get too like you know into like the mud but like what are some things for you that like you value in your life that are just like non-negotiables like in any situation it could be like dating social just like but like but what are those key factors that you've identified is that are really important to like your success as a person one of the first things that's really really big for me is the energy that the person has and i find that the way they resonate with me is really important off the bat I have people in my social circle that uh, are not those people that are always on the up and they're not those people that are always seeing things as the glass is half full. And that's okay because I love them dearly and they are who they are. Um, but I don't go out and actively choose those people in my life because I know that it does create a certain amount of energy imbalance for me. And I find myself in a position where I'm an actually giving person that I give a lot. And then I come out of that friendship very depleted. So yeah. for that reason, I tend to resonate with people who are like me. Uh, I resonate with people who have goals in life, who are looking to do something with themselves. And they don't have to be big goals. It doesn't have to be, I want to change the world. It could be as simple as, I really want to be a great parent for my child. Or uh, I want to get to the next stage in, in my health or in my work. So... I'm not necessarily just associating with the one percenters because that's actually pretty tough to do in the everyday environment. Yeah. But I'm looking for people who resonate with me. Um, one of the big non-negotiables with me is people that don't question my faith. So I have a lot of non-Christian friends, lots of non-Christian friends. Um, but I, I don't align myself with people who, who will outwardly attack me because of the choices that I make in my life. Uh, while I respect everyone's right to have an opinion, and I'm always willing to hear it, I never attack anyone by having differences to me. I, I respect it because the truth of the matter is we all have free will and we make our own choices. Yeah. So I don't invite people into my life that will openly attack me and try and make me feel bad or try and lift themselves by putting me down. So that for me is a real non-negotiable. Uh, the other non-negotiable... Like, just jumping in there... And sorry, yeah. okay, just jumping there real quick. The one thing that I've really noticed in situations like that is it's when people actually don't believe in what they think they believe in is when they openly attack what other people believe in. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. And uh, I find also when you own things that, doesn't, that don't sit with other people, they can get very uncomfortable with it. But then when they have an interest in it but don't know how to define that interest or have been brought up a certain way, as I find is the case quite frequently, people inherit their beliefs from their parents. And we all know that we all know how the mind works and how our beliefs, our belief structures get initially created until we're courageous enough to go and start nitpicking at them and saying, well, where did that come from? And why does that work? Or why doesn't that work? And do I want to keep that one? Or is that going to be part of me? Or am I going to throw that one away and, and decide, no, you know what, that's what I was brought up with, but that doesn't suit. But I find that a lot of people don't actually go to the extent of questioning that they just become. Yeah. And then if you get in a, into a conversation with someone like me, for instance, who's, who's taken the time out to do the reflection and decided what I want to embody in my life and also what I want to extract, mm -hmm. then quite often people can become uncomfortable about that and go, well, how do you know? How do you know? And my response is always, I've taken time to get to know myself and I know what I resonate with. And I recommend you do the same. It's a journey, it's reflection, it takes time and it's constant if you really want to continue to better yourself and to open yourself up to the possibilities of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because we all kind of have like our little process and you know, like one of the processes that I have found is that, um, you know, because I'm, I'm big into going to the mountains in the backcountry living in Vancouver, obviously, like we're nestled kind of right in between the ocean and, and the mountains, right? So like mm -hmm. I spend a lot of my time in the backcountry. So, you know, man, woman, young, old, you know, like whatever, whoever it is, um, I've actually recognized that because I lead a lot of like expeditions into the backcountry and I'm just, I happen to be there with people that when you're silent with people in an environment that you connect with, you will really understand that if you connect with them. So like when we're like, you know, away from cell phone range, you know, like we're 10, 20 miles into the back country and like we're sitting there and like nobody's saying anything, everybody's just kind of having that moment. Mm -hmm. Like you feel when there's like a, an energy presence that should be there. 
no matter how you want to identify where that energy may have like started, originated, you know, like what causes it or anything. Yeah. I think if you take enough time out to simply just say, what do I feel around me? Like what is mm -hmm. going on around me and how do I feel right now? You really understand like true connections with people. And I feel like I understand the most about people when they're in my environment that I connect with and there's just real passive communication going on. I completely agree. Unfortunately, those social situations are often caused now over a few drinks at a bar. Yeah. Um, and yeah. they're quite limited because of that. And that was definitely my experience in my early 20s. It was, I was always connecting with people on a different, a, a different level. I was always that one that wanted to go into the deep conversations and, and really explore someone's mind and, and share ideas and really have them challenge me and me to challenge them. And a group of friends, we used to love doing that sort of stuff, but it wasn't until like you, I went and I went out into nature and just started getting out. And because I live in the city, it's a little bit harder, but I had to make an active choice to go and walk on the beach or go and do a bushwalk or literally just be outside at a park or something. And, and kids are the best for that because they make you get outside. So all of a sudden you have this, this reason to make it a priority to go to the park and see the kids run around and look at the ducks on the pond and just such simple things that we take for granted or don't consider at all. But the connection, the energy connection for me is always in the silence. See, and it's funny that you label it because I've actually never really thought about this before, like in depth. I've kind of re recognized it going on, but you know, because kids always want to typically be outside unless we kind of force them to be inside around the trunk. So like kids typically want to walk out the front door, right? But because we're out there and if you want to experience your children and actually engage with them, a lot of that is just watching them as they grow up and how they interact, you know, especially kind of, you know, maybe seven and below, six and below when they're just really kind of developing, you know, like personality, like characteristics and like an understanding towards life. Like I spend a lot of my time just watching my kids and how they interact like at the duck pond or when we go for a hike or when we're foraging for food and all that kind of stuff and just seeing it. So like you're by, we, by default been kind of doing the same thing, like being outside and nature and passive communication and just kind of going by feel and end interpretation to be able to build that connection. They realize that I've always kind of been doing that with them and not really recognizing it. I love the fact that you're present enough to do that too. I mean, you've got three children, eight and under. Yeah. For most parents, the, the thought of actually sitting there and, and watching their children by the duck pond doesn't enter their mind. I mean, you see it every day. They're on their phones. Yeah. The kids are over there. They're fine. They're safe. They're having a good time. We're outdoors. I'm, I'm doing what I need to do as a parent. Now it's me time. I'm on my phone. Yeah. Uh, so the sheer fact that you're sitting there enjoying your children and, and recognizing the beauty and the fact that you're never going to have this moment again. They're yeah. going to grow up and if you don't stop and appreciate it, you'll miss it. Uh, I think that's huge. I did the same thing last night with my little guy. Um, my daughter's away on camp and he loves the time when it's just mummy and him. We call it date night. Yeah. So it's, buddy, what do you want to do? Well, I want to do this and I want to do that. I'm like, okay, well, let's just do it. And we'll yeah. go out and we'll do it. And he'll do the cutest little things like open the door for me in the car and come on mummy and he'll hold my hands and he'll yeah. treat me like the man He kind of steps up into the man zone. But for him, that time is so important. And he always asks me, mummy, when's, when's the next camp? When's the next camp? Yeah. What are we going to do next time? Because that time for them to bond with, I think as parents, we can easily get caught up in too much of the busyness of life of trying to provide for our children financially and giving them activities to do when in actual fact all they want is our time they want our, our presence yeah and you know and when you do because i actually do the same thing like i when i'm with my girls like i try not to ever like say okay we're gonna go do this like i just say like what do you guys want to do like you know maybe like present like some options but like they kind of know it and most of the time it's like i want to go to a park okay well, where does the park need to have okay the park needs to have monkey bars okay let's go find a park with monkey bars or like you know, like those kind of things, because I want them to be able to be like the happy, happiest in their environment. And mm -hmm. I don't want to tell them where they should be happy because these are their only free years to be able to have like this kind of like unadulterated fun where it's not being like mandated and dictated. It's yeah. like, you want to play some old school Nintendo for half an hour? Fine. Let's play some old school Mario Kart. It's terrible. But I'm like, 
who cares? And they're like, do you want to go to the park? Do we want to go ride scooters? Okay, it's raining, but we're outside riding scooters in the rain and the cold, like whatever. Like, let's go experience right. life because, you know, for the, the vast majority of my life, I'm thinking I'm like a lot of other people who, you know, well, people in general, but especially goal-driven people where we have to tote a very kind of like strict line because we're told it's about, I need to follow this path. Like I've set like this goal, this is how I'm going to achieve it. So there wasn't a lot of like variance outside of that. But then once I realized there's like, so much of life that I'm missing outside of those two lanes, like that keeps me down this certain path. I was missing just like a lot of like opportunity, not only professionally, but personally and like opportunities with my kids and all that kind of stuff too. And to really pull it back and realize that, okay, well, I'm told that I should work nine to five, Monday to Friday, typically, you know, here in Canada. But I'm like, if I just kind of look at it that every day is just a day and I'm here to be able to, yeah, provide, you know, finances. I'm also here to be able to raise these children. I'm here to be able to build these situations and drop the nine to five concept, the Monday to Friday, you know, like all these kind of things that actually really don't make a whole lot of sense to me. And I don't really connect with them because, you know, I feel like they imprison me more than they empower me. Um, because yeah. again, it comes back to like that, well, I'm not going to sleep for eight or 10 hours a night. Like I actually feel worse sleeping eight or 10 hours than I do sleeping five hours. Um, because I just literally can't sleep eight or 10 hours. Um, but I feel like that same thing, thing too. And it's like, when you try to like fit in all of these different little boxes and categories, I would rather just experience life as like this vast chunk of time and like, just be more present in today. And in this time, like with you and I talking right now, like I don't want my cell phone to be on, like after it rang, I shut it off. Like I want to be zeroed in on like this experience with you. And like, yes, we both have all the rest of the day to be able to live but i used to be the type of person that thinks okay after this i have this meeting okay well it takes like 30 minutes to drive there so i gotta wrap this up by then because i have to be here on time okay then there's school pick up at you know 240 yeah. like and i just washed myself of all of that like a couple of years ago and i was just like oh man it was like dropping the concept of feeling like i have to sleep for eight hours a night it's so true. We put ourselves under so much pressure. I actually did a Facebook live about this yesterday because I watched um, it. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> the um this the last week that I've had, uh, I I do learning programs, so I write learning programs as well as do coaching. And there was a, a, a implementation date on this program that I'm working on that got brought forward two months. Mm -hmm. So we were planning out for a, a May delivery, and it's been brought forward and it's a non-negotiable. So all of a sudden we've gone from, yes, we're planning, we're fine. Everything's good to squeezing everything in. And it's so ridiculously compressed and it's, it's a date that has to happen. So it's one of those times where you have to go into complete hustle mode. So this week for me, that's just gone has been absolutely that it's been total hustle and to get things done. I've had to do things I wouldn't normally do like your 1am mornings. And I've had multiple nights where it's been four hours sleep. Mm -hmm. So I know when my body's saying to me enough is enough, but I also know that I need to recharge this weekend to be able to be my best again for the next weekend. So when I spoke to my little guy about, Hey, you know, mommy's been really busy this week. What do you want to do this weekend so that we can have some time together? But I also need to catch up on some rest. He says, well, can we do this tonight? And can we do that tomorrow? And how about tomorrow afternoon? He says, um, he goes, I know there's a movie that you like to watch and how about we put that on and we'll, we'll have a cuddle on the couch and if you fall asleep, that's okay. That's awesome. <laughs> and I thought that is so sweet because he's thinking yeah. of me as well, but he just wants the time. Um, but sometimes you just have to do the hustle with it and other times it's just about being able to extend it out and enjoy things more. I find we get to task focus and I was guilty of this for years because I was a, uh, a high energy, high task oriented person, that's how I identified with my success. So it was always about get the stuff done, get it done, get it done, get it done. And I forgot to have the experience in the meantime, because the reality is there's always something else to do. Yeah. And if you're one of those people like me that wants to constantly achieve, then it's not hard to find something else. Yeah. So you get caught up, you get caught up in the stuff. And I found personally that I got to the, the stage where that sense of satisfaction 
really wasn't there anymore. People would come up and congratulate me on doing something and I'd be like, oh yeah, thanks. Yeah. And the response would be, well, aren't you excited? Aren't you happy? That's amazing. And I'd gotten to the point where it was, well, it's just another thing that I did really. And I'd lost the fulfillment in it. I'd gotten to the goal and went, okay, tick, what's next? And I was always chasing the next thing. But what, I, what I'd lost was the experience while I was doing it. So I went from that person who was forgetting to be present. And my mum used to always say to me, it used to drive me insane, you've got to stop and smell, smell the roses. I'm like, mom, you have to stop. It's killing me. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I reworded that into something that was more literal for me that I really understood what she was trying to say to me. And what she was trying to say was, you need to experience life. Yeah. And I completely eradicated that on my journey to get the stuff done. And once I tweaked into that and started making those subtle changes, I enabled myself to create more time and to get more, more joy out of things. So now I'm that person that I, I make time to chat to people. I schedule time out during my day because I know how my focus patterns work. I know that if I'm not in flow, I can't focus for a solid hour. And I know the days that I'm going to be in flow for. So I'll make sure I take some time out and I'll wind that into something that I need to achieve or not. Sometimes it's just, I've noticed someone's not looking the best today. So I'll go and make some time to go and just chat and see how they're doing. And that enables me to be able to do my tasks better, to get more fulfillment out of my tasks, because then I've I've given something as well. It's not just been about ticking boxes. See, and it's funny that you say that because I don't know whether like I just haven't talked to anybody who's willing to be honest about that side, you know, but I've done that like my entire life up until about a couple of years ago too. And I decided just to kind of really scale like everything back and just kind of be more present in like the day to day operations of my life and like the hour to hour, because I feel like I got backed into that corner because of uh, partially because of my personality and partially because like I have a meeting orientated day all day, every day. That's just the way it is. So you kind of get slowly down that road. But like I would do extraordinary things physically. And when people would ask me like, how did you do that? Like, why did you do it? Or like, what did you learn? Like, and I'd be like, nothing. I just, I just did it. Like, Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, like, you know, like you, uh, like I would do these things and like somebody be like, well, what was the view like? Or like, can you explain it to me? I'm like, well, no, I can tell you what like the start line and the finish line was like, or like, I can tell you the time I did it in, but I couldn't, I had nothing about the experience or, you know, like when it came to like starting businesses or like anything, like it was like, here's a start, here's where we need to be. Okay. Let Brady set go. But it was forgetting that it was like this nurturing process, like along the way. And I feel a lot like that's what children did in my life like it really made me not want to like get past that and I know exactly the day where it happened and I was listening to like a um, before I started listening to podcasts this was probably about nine years ago now and um, the reporter was talking about uh, they were interviewing a, a psychologist and they said like when we are walking down the street with our child and they stop and want to pick up that rock or you know pick up that blade of grass we're like okay come on come on let's go but mm-hmm. we don't give them that moment. We're taking their creativity, like their thought process, like we're robbing them of all these little moments because we are really in a hurry to do nothing, you yeah. know, but simply because they stopped, like we're taking away like what they have the fundamental right to do and what they need to do to start figuring things out in their life and not program the same thing in them. What we're doing is like, there's more, I have to do this next thing. But like a lot of this stuff that we really fill our days with is so completely superficial and irrelevant. We forget about that time. And that completely changed my thought process from that point forward about just like how it's going to like operate in my life. But I still feel like it creeps into my day sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, yeah. it just is it, because it's so programmed. And like when Laura Interlandi was on the podcast, she, the one thing that she said was that, you know, our first in or our first reaction is our programming our social programming and our second mm-hmm. reaction is our intuition so if we just stop for long enough to get through our programming and allow our intuition to be able to speak to us we will live much happier lives like how do you feel about that 
I completely agree with it. Uh, Tony Robbins advocates the 90 second rule with your emotions and with your decisions if you're unsure of it. And uh, I completely agree with it's your programming that shows up first because I see it often in people when I'm coaching them that their reaction or their response to something will be straight off the bat. And then you start digging a little deeper and all of a sudden it's, oh, well, actually that's not quite right because of whatever reason and they'll often change how they perceive something but their programming will always show up first and that's been one of the really big things for me um, in changing my style because I used to be what's called a high D on the disc profile I was that sergeant major I was the drill sergeant I was made for the military and when I was younger I actually wanted to be a RAF pilot uh, that was my goal I wanted to fly fighter jets I was going to be the first woman to fly fighter jets that's exactly what I was going to do and I still remember the day vividly where I was told quite distinctly, honey, you're not going to fly jets. Your eyesight's shocking. And I just went, what? What do you mean I can't fly jets because of my eyesight? So like, well, you've had two eye surgeries as a kid. Your eyesight's average at best. So you can't fly jets. And I was just lost. I didn't know what to do because that was what my goals and my programming had set up for me for my whole life. But I remember profoundly sitting in an orphanage in Cambodia in 2009. I went there with about 40 other youth and uh, sitting there in the dirt with kids that didn't have families and they all had AIDS and watching them just play in this dirt with rocks and, and building out of tires and just pieces of wood from the construction site and bricks and things and I wasn't a parent at that stage I became a parent later on that year but I'm sitting there going oh my goodness this is so dangerous they shouldn't be playing with that so my programming kicks in straight away and says oh no no they can't do that it's, it's dangerous and one of the house parents who spoke English very well says no no she says we want them to be creative if they cut their finger that's fine we fix it and I thought Wow, it made me think as a, as a non-parent at the time about how I wanted to parent my child, but also about why were there no toys in this orphanage? I just assumed it was because they couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the director of the orphanage has actually said it was a conscious choice to not give these kids things like Barbie dolls and G.I. Joes and dollhouses because he wanted them to be creative and because he he'd enabled that environment you see kids that are in these little makeshift boats that they've constructed themselves that are canoeing down the outside of the duct yeah. purely because he'd allowed their creativity to do what it needed to do and that for me was huge and i find we try and create an environment for not just our kids but for the people around us where we think we know what they need to be and so with love or with the best intentions we say well why don't you do this well we don't necessarily know what's right for that person and we need to help them to find what's right for them and i think that's the thing with coaching is it's not about oh you should it's more about well have you considered and why did you make that choice and i utilize the same thing with my kids it's well okay honey why did you make that choice well i don't know well let's think about it Let's think about why you did that. And once they've got the time to, to go back and reflect, they always know. And to be able to give them some empowerment to say, well, how do you think that went? Do you think that you could have made a different choice and got a different response? It's almost always, yeah, I should have done this because if I'd done this, that would have happened and that would have been better. And I know for that next time, my little guy will sit there and say, Mummy, I'm going to play Lego today because I want to be creative. You go, okay, great. He says, I want to do some writing. I want to write my storybook. And Lego helps me to think. I'm like, he's eight years old and he already knows that. That's so crazy, eh? See, and like the one thing that like when you were like talking about it, and I guess like you kind of helped me fine tune my thought, like as you just made that last statement was, um, do you think because like, you know, and I don't know what it's like in Australia. I mean, they use this generally because this is what we typically do here is that like we give like our children and ourselves like an excessive amount of stuff that we don't need. Like we, we are over consumers, like, and in abundance, like, do you think that that is subsequently teaching not only us, but our children to truly never really be rooted in happiness because there's always something else that can fulfill 
and you know get that little bit of like serotonin release and like that dopamine release because there's something new and we don't know how to connect with rooted happiness absolutely i completely agree with that um grandparents are the worst for it because they give their grandkids absolutely everything i'm constantly saying to my parents can you stop buying them crap please they don't need it uh, my kids don't have an awful lot, not because I'm trying to deprive them, but because they have what they need. Uh, I'm not that parent that will go and buy them an ice cream because they cry. It'll be, well, sweetheart, if you want an ice cream, then you earn money. You can buy an ice cream. Mm -hmm. And they don't think about that. But what I'm trying to do is to give them a sense of empowerment within reasonable limits for their age, of course, but also to get them to understand that nothing comes easily. Uh, they'll they'll say to me, well, mommy, why don't you go and buy it? I'm like, well, because I don't need it. Yeah, but you want it. Like, yes, but I don't need it right now. And I don't want it so badly that I need to have it at this point in time. I'll make a plan to get it for later on when it's more suitable. And they're learning about you don't need to have it now. Uh, we, in my home, we do planning. And because as you can possibly imagine, single parenting is pretty busy. So yeah we plan for two weeks. It's okay. These are what activities we have on and this is what food we're going to eat on any given night. For my little guy, he likes that because he knows what to expect. For my daughter, that works well for her because she also knows how to get involved with the preparation because that's what she loves. But I'm purposely that parent that doesn't have my kids in something every single day. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way that my two children work is vastly different. My little guy likes to stay home. He's an inherent homebody. If he had his way, he'd be home 24-7 and never really go much of anywhere except when he wants to go out to play. That's like he would my be oldest. very, very happy. Same? That's like, yeah, my oldest daughter's that way. Right, yeah. Whereas my daughter, uh, she's swim squad three days a week, does swim races, wants to be the achiever in that element, does, does music, does, uh, goes for school captain, uh, gets involved in the debate team. She's the one that does all that academic stuff and everything else. And if there's an opportunity, she'll always take it. She got involved in the futsal team last week. I said, well, what made you do that? She goes, well, I've never done it. I thought I'd try it. Great. How do you find it? She goes, I don't like it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But she tried it. And again, like what you're, like what you, we were kind of talking about before and like this is just, you know, like allowing them to be able to understand who they are by giving them freedom to be able to do that and understanding that they're different. And, you know, kind of like over the, like the last like few years too, the one thing that has constantly been brought to like, you know, that I've had to face is that, you know, you happen to be a part of your children's lives, but you don't own them. Like they are not representations of you. So and true. It's like, and it's hard because like, you're never told that. Like I, I've never been told that before, but like now I'm being faced with that. And I'm like, that is true because like, I don't want to be my mom and dad. I love my mom and dad, uh, but I don't want to be them. I want to be me. You know? Mm -hmm. So then when I look at like these three kids, I'm just like, well, who are you? Like, and that's how I approach them now. You even like my youngest, who's, you know, three in a few weeks. I just, you know, I'm like, I just need you to be you because I need to figure out how to be able to support you like in those environments like like what do you love you know so like like my youngest like she just she has to show her dominance she just sits on my shoulders all the time like that just if you see her and me together she's like on my shoulders she looks at her sisters this is me this is my spot I'm like if that's what you love like you just want that affection that connection that is you my middle daughter's like an MMA fighter in training like she's just going to be this ruthless little warrior and it's like the, like the rough and tumble like I used to be like you know don't jump off that couch this that next thing but then I realized I'm like it's not her fault that her personality is that she just loves to be the one who climbs trees jumps off things and we don't live outside or we don't live and we're not a nomadic tribe so like I force her into this house that her at her being six doesn't connect with at all doesn't understand why she can't really jump off the couch because everything inside of her is saying, jump off the couch, jump off the couch, jump off the couch. And then we fight about it. And then she ends up getting a timeout. Then I realize I'm like, that's not her fault. Like, it's mm -hmm. not her fault that she loves to do those things. And like everything instinctually inside her says, I needed to be active because she was probably protecting the tribe before. Like she is one of the people that were doing that. You know, like my youngest would be like one of the ones that like, nurtures and my oldest would be one of the ones that like made the clothes you know and, mm -hmm. like and I can see that in them but again it's like 
because we live inside these four walls, you need to act this certain way because I'm told that I need to tell you to act this certain way, but I'm not respecting like your personality and it creates conflict between us. So like, it's interesting trying to find like the happy balances between it all. It's really tricky. I see my son and my father and oh my goodness, you know, you've got this eight year old with this six foot one man and my dad's trying to negotiate with my little guy and my little guy's just so in tune with who he is and he'll just go, no daddy, I'm not doing it that way. You can't make me. And my dad being brought up in the generation is you'll do what you are told. And he says, no, I don't have to, I don't have to do this because I don't think it's right. So I'm not doing it. And so we used my to dad doesn't know how to handle it. Right. Like we used to think yeah, he like, that exactly. was a child he disrespecting a parent, but I'm like, I'm like, I actually, within reason obviously but like i actually don't think that it is anymore because again like it's not this you know you respect me because i'm your parent you respect me because i tell you to you do what i tell you to and like that's the bottom line because it's like if anything is going to create conflict that's going to create conflicts i can't walk into any other environment in my day and expect for people to be able to like respond in a positive way if i'm doing any of those things exactly right and i think that's touched really really well on a point that we all need to be mindful of especially in the generations that we're in now you know you got your gen x you got your millennials you got your gen y's and we're all going through this phase if we choose to especially in gen x and gen y of almost an enlightenment where we're starting to understand things better because the knowledge industry is so available now you've got people like me that will go on facebook and, and youtube and the like and put stuff out there that is purposely thought provoking to make people consider other alternatives and we'll give them enough information in it that they'll be able to go away and make their own decisions. We never had that before. That availability of resource and materials was never there. And in our parents' defense, they were never brought up that way. It was always get married, have kids, work hard, pay the house off, pay for your kids to go through university and then sit back and live the rest of your life and die happy. That, that was it. Mm -hmm. That was really what they were taught to believe. And that's indefinitely what my, my parents' families were conditioning them to believe. So that's, that's all they've ever had. So I noticed that in my family, when I kind of come in and I'm the one that always challenges everything, my dad finds it immensely frustrating. He loves, loves it, but he's, he tells me constantly, you frustrate the crap out of me. Yeah. My, well, I don't do things the way you want me to do them. And I'm constantly asking you why it's important to you for me to do things this way. And he says, well, you just need to do as you're told. You're dad, I'm an adult. I make my own decisions. You raised me to be an independent woman. Well, congratulations, you've created one. Yeah. He says, but you're supposed to still do as you're told. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the thing with our kids. We raise them differently because we know differently. And I'm, I'm, reluctant to use the word better because I don't want to be disrespectful to the fact that the generations are different. We're supposed to learn and grow. Mm. I'm not supposed to parent my children the way my parents parented me. My children won't parent their children the way that I've parented them. In fact, if they do parent their children the way that I've parented them, I'll be encouraging them to learn and grow more so they can do it better. Mm. Uh, it's just resonant to where you are in a particular time of life and what you've been taught and what independently we, we've brought on into our own lives. Yeah. See, and it's in the end, like, where do you say that? And like, I'm, I'm actually glad that you worded and came around back. Like, so it's not, it's not better. It's different. And it's the same thing. Like we see it with music. We see it with like food. We see it in like multiple different areas, but like when it comes down to like parenting, like it legitimately isn't, quote unquote better it's just different based on the yeah. times because you know like I look at it like especially when it comes to like our parents because our parents are the same age you know and stuff right so like so like I went in a small town in southern Alberta I went to a Catholic school for the first few years of my life and I legitimately got the strap for saying the fuck on the playground <laughs> and I was just like but like and my mom lost her her mind and like that's one of the one of the reasons why you know we also moved you know but like one of the reasons why like I exited that school too but I could never imagine hitting like one of my child children never mind hitting somebody else's child you know but yeah. like I look at like all the different forms of that that was like apparent in my childhood you know like like a wooden spoon washing your mouth that was soap like all these kind of things that were kind of like generational over here like in Canada that were just kind of like the standard things that you did 
But like I, when you take that compares to like, let's sit down and try to understand why you acted like that. Like, and for me, like when I'm talking to my kids, like I just do it based on feelings. Like when you acted like that, like how did it make you feel? Or if somebody treated you like that, how would it make you feel? Or mm -hmm. like if you're fighting me to do your homework, like what would you want me to do to help you? You know, like, like let's mm -hmm. figure this out, like force you to like think about it, like what you said, where it's not just like the blind interaction, like do this because I tell you to, or I'm physically going to abuse you till that you actually do it. Or like, I will emotionally yeah. abuse you to do this. Like, let's sit down and figure it out because that's what we're supposed to be doing from generation yes. to generation. Like you said, yes. it's like trying our best to make it different, but making that different more positive or like what is positive is what we can make it right now. Absolutely. My daughter wants to be a pediatric surgeon. Oh. She's known for the last four years. That's what she wants to do after some stints in the children's hospital as a kid. And so we started planning back then for her to slowly elevate her work at school so that when she got to the point where she really had to study, it didn't feel like such a major shift. And I used to say to her, we'll just do subtle things every year. We'll do a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. So she's now the kid that asks for the extension work from the teacher. She gets it finished as quickly as she can. She'll get the extension work in class. She's the one that will have the parent teacher interview on the first day of school and I'll meet the teacher and the three of us will go up and say, here's what, here's what she wants to do this year. How can we work together to achieve that? And yeah. she's already worked out what she wants to do. So when she gets those moments where it's, I don't want to do that, it's well, okay. How's that going to affect your goal of being a pediatric surgeon? And sometimes it's, mummy, it won't. I'm just not doing my homework today. I'm like, great, then don't do it today. When are you going to do it then? I'll do it tomorrow. And it, okay, when are you going to do it tomorrow? I'm going to do it tomorrow when I come home and I've got time here. It's, okay, great, do it then. Yeah. What are you going to do now? She's like, I just want to rest or I just want to play. Okay, go. And so long as she's okay with it in her own mind and she can make those decisions. And sometimes it's, yeah, mommy, it's probably going to affect me being a surgeon. And I know in the back of my mind it won't, but yeah. I want her to be able to make those active choices of understanding how every choice has a consequence. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, and one thing that like immediately comes to my mind, like when, when you're speaking like that, like in coaching your child down like this road is that it's, we, I think are all typically like that where we kind of delay it to the, and we make it way worse on ourselves because it's like, we know we have this three month deadline, but it only becomes relevant in the last two weeks. But if we would have spent the entire three months, it would have been so much easier and better. And it might've gone a, a more positive direction, like all this kind of stuff. But like, like what a great opportunity is to slowly like coach her down like this road of just thinking like, like you have essentially like, you know, like, 18 years you know when you're going through like your schooling like process I don't know how old she was when she went to children's um you know but like you have all this time you know take a an extra camp in this or you know like read these books over time or like you just you just gain this knowledge so like you said at one point in time it just doesn't seem like a flood of it or when she gets that flood, she can cope with it so much more because she has such a better intellectual base about that yeah, absolutely. And it's subtle changes. And I know personally, I'm the one that will thrive in the process pain. So I'm that one that will look at, I've got two months for a deadline for something and I'll do a little bit and do a little bit and do a little bit because I know inherently I step up when the pressure's on. So I've had to teach myself out of that when I became aware of the impact of the people around me when I'm in that process pain. And I remember doing some coaching uh, last year on it and I was talking to my coach saying, I just don't want to get this thing done. I know it needs to be done and I'm, I just don't want to do it. And he's like, well, why don't you want to do it? I'm like, I'm not interested in it. There's no flow in it. I'm really not invested. And he says, well, do you have to do it anyway? Well, yeah, I do. And he says, well, what are you going to do? And then we came to the conclusion that I'm one of those people, much like everyone, we either thrive in the pleasure or we thrive in the, pain, in the pain. And for a high majority of us, we thrive in the pain because we're used to that. We create environments where through procrastination, lack of interest or otherwise, we just don't do what needs to be done. So then what happens is the item still needs to be completed. The task needs to be done still. So we create for ourselves this environment where all of a sudden it is, it's here and we're under pressure 
And for some of us, like me, I attuned myself to kick in with that pressure and go, right. And my creative flow was off the charts. I got more done study-wise in the six months that I was pregnant with my second child than I'd done in my life because I had just created this environment for myself where I felt like I had no time left. And I went and did two diplomas in six months purely because my head was ready for it. And I thought, let's just go with this. I mean, I'm pregnant with one child working full time and I'm doing two diplomas. I was mad, but my brain was ready for it. And I had to unravel myself and teach myself better habits because the on flow effects of that process pain were that meant that I wasn't getting enough sleep. That meant that I wasn't as patient with the kids as I should be. That meant that I wasn't making the right decisions. If something came up out of the blue, it meant that, um, I was forgetting things that I wouldn't normally forget, just little things that I'd be on top of, I'd forget them. And so once I realized the onflow effects of me choosing to be in that process pain and, and the person that that made me become, I thought, oh, well, I really don't like that. I need to train myself out of it. So it took a long time because I'd lived in that process pain for so long and I still do at times. I still do put things off and go, oh, I just, I really just don't want to do that. I'm not interested in it. So I've learned and I'm getting much better at the whole, right? You do the things you don't like first. So it's kind of like the parents saying to the kid, eat your veggies, save your favorite things till last, eat the ones you don't like first. Yeah. So that's a lesson for me. And I find that's quite prevalent across a lot of the people that I talk to as well. Once they become aware of the fact of, oh, I don't do that because I don't like it. And then I create an environment where I'm stressed and I become this whole other person. Automatically they feel bad and it's, Oh my goodness, I'm choosing this and I don't have to. And helping them to understand that is the first step and then giving them tools to be able to stick to a plan to avoid it. And instead of going to the finish line, you set to finish beforehand. Uh, it's like in, in martial arts, they teach you not to punch at the item, they teach you to punch past it. It's the same with boxing. I used to be a boxing instructor and it was always don't hit the pad, hit the person behind it. So you'd see people force their fist into the pad and the punching was so much harder because psychologically they weren't pulling back. And it's the same with the process pain. It's instead of going to the point where you get it in on the due date, this will bring the due date forward and then give yourself that buffer in case something goes wrong. And that's a whole psychological retrain, especially if you're one of those people that lives in the process pain and you know, tolerates it. And some people actually love it. They love the stress and they don't care about the effects on the people around them. It's no, oh, I like the stress. I'm fine with it. I work better under pressure than any other way. Mm. But is that just because people haven't taken like the time out to really understand, like, like you said, like the impact on like, their environment, their community, the people like around them, right? Um, yeah. I have like, a question for you. Um, you kind of like alluded that, you know, when you were pregnant with your second, you went through like all, you got these two diplomas in six months that it kind of made like a shift. Is there any other like time in, in like your life that you identify as like the pivotal point? Like at this time, like there was like this shift. This is the reason why like everything kind of changed or like what really kick started like your growth as a person or well, into the environment you are. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the the most prevalent one for me was in 2018. Um, I'd been a single parent for a couple of years and I'd just been trying to work out my new life, basically. I'd picked up uh, extra work to pay bills and um, I'd made promises to my kids that I intended to keep come hell or high water and they all had financial commitments to them. So I'm always the person that doesn't let anyone down no matter what the cost. So I just stepped into who I've always been. I, I went away for eight days to see family and my sister commented on, my goodness, you need to rest while you're here, you're exhausted. Well, yeah, that's fine, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And she was great, her and her husband basically took care of the kids and I was on autopilot and she's, I didn't have to think much of anything. But as soon as I got on the plane to go back home, I started to feel unwell. I remember walking into the hospital a few days, uh, walking into the doctor's surgery a few days later and I had photophobia, which basically means an intolerance of light. Uh, my body was aching, I was sweating, uh, my energy levels were down, I couldn't hydrate myself. I knew something was wrong, I figured it was just the flu. 
And I went in and saw the doctor and he's got me to do a balance test. And he's this little Indian guy that comes up to about my shoulders. He said, I want you to stand up and I want you to close your eyes. And I've worked in a medical field through life insurance. I know what that means. And I said, if I fall, you're not going to catch me. I'm too tall. No, no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. I fell. As soon as I closed my eyes, I fell. And he's put me down on the chair. He's, he's written me out a, a triage letter to go to the hospital. He says, you have to go now. Yeah. Me being stubborn, my daughter had a swim meet that night. I was volunteering. I didn't want to let anyone down. So I went and made my commitments. And I promised them that if I woke up the next morning feeling bad, I'd go to the hospital. Long and short, next afternoon, I'm sitting in triage. Uh, I've gone to the hospital. They've gotten out the crash cart because my blood pressure is so low. My heart rate is so low. They think I'm about to have a cardiac arrest. I'm laughing at them saying, I'm fine, I've just got the flu. Next thing you know, I'm whizzed into isolation. I've got the chief oncologist and hematologist asking me questions. Have you been overseas recently? Have you had chemotherapy recently? Do you have HIV? And I'm sitting there going, no, no, no. I've just got a migraine and the flu. Give me some saline. Give me some pain relief. I'll be out of here in a few hours. And they said, oh, you're not going anywhere. And it was then they said to me that, with the blood test that they'd given me, I'd had uh, abdominal scans and everything, but the blood that they'd gotten back very quickly had indicated to them that my neutrophils, which is my white blood cells, was so low that my immune system was completely shot. Yeah. They said, you don't realise how close you are to actually dying. All it will take is someone that actually has the flu sneezing on you, and if we don't get to it quick enough, we won't be able to save you. They said, your body can't fight. It's got nothing left. And I was completely unaware. I had no idea. I was just doing what needed to be done. I thought I was tired. You know, I had all the signs of fatigue, but I definitely didn't have any signs of burnout. And there was nothing to suggest I was near death. So for me, that was huge. They spent uh, eight days in the hospital. And the only reason it wasn't longer was because I begged and pleaded and promised to not go back to work. Uh, lumbar punches and all sorts of tests. And it took them days to find out what was wrong. And the only reason they located the virus was because my body had already started producing the antibodies. Otherwise, they were completely stuck. So that for me was a real wake-up call about how I was doing things and why I was doing things the way I was. So I was wrapped in cotton wool by my parents and my family for a little while and I just decided to do what I do and go, right, let's have a look at this. How am I living my life? What are the important things? What's my diet like? What's my exercise like? What's my sleep like? And it was around about the same time that I started um, getting, uh, being part of the Jay Shetty Genius Group and Jay's amazing with all this mindset training and things like that. And his subject for the month was actually health. So it was perfect timing for me. And so I started to go on a journey to look at the way I did things and completely shifted it all up. Started to be very demanding on how I managed my time. Started to eradicate things that were not good for me. Started to make different choices financially, uh, different choices on the people that I socialized with. And it just really grew from there. Mm -hmm. Well, how, like I want... I know it's like hard to, I guess I kind of just mean this like generally because I would assume that you kind of pool yourself with a lot of people like what I do, just like really high performing like individuals that kind of like all, you know, are, you know, either fatigued or burnt out or, you know, walking down that line or, you know, maybe they've kind of got, you know, past that, but like you had no indication, right? Like you just, like you would have just kept on going. Like, I wonder how many of us are kind of like toning like that same line like you, just, you don't really know but like you were on the brink of this but like because either you want to call it we're like so stubborn or so determined or we're hard-headed or we're goal-oriented or we're a type person like all these excuses we can come up with to keep pushing that same agenda every day but like like we don't know like we we have no idea what's going on but like that's the problem with like the placebo effect you know it's like we don't know or like we do know or we think we're doing good so by then like good like perpetuates like inside of us like mm. like it's just so astonishing that like you were at that point and like you're just you're so strong and you're so like going to that but you push yourself to that level like it's just it's amazing what our bodies and our minds 
can do. Mm -hmm. Like whether yeah. even at like the most detriment, like it'll sacrifice ourselves as a person. But like you would think that we wouldn't or shouldn't be able to go that far. But it just makes me realize that if we can go that far, push yourself down a road that'll ultimately harm us. Like how far can we go down a road that is just like you know what we call tail, you know, or like uh, what people are kind of jumping on, like the enlightenment and grounded and happy yeah. and like like how far can we push down that road because we obviously know there's a lot of people like you like we've heard those stories lots yeah and like there's a lot of people kind of like teetering on that brink you know but like what's the flip side of that like where can we go with that like like what do you think like what's your your thought process on that i um i think we have a unlimited potential uh, you just need to listen to the dave goggins story to understand that we're really our own limits and i'm a firm believer in that I see a lot of people that talk about the I can't and I shouldn't. And my first question to them is always, well, why not? Why can't you? Why shouldn't you? And more often than not, they don't have a reason. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I never considered myself to be a high performer. I always considered myself to just be an average person that got stuff done. I never once considered myself to be uh, someone who excels despite the results that I got in, in my life. It was just, there was always someone that did it better. There was always someone that had, had more. Uh, I always considered the fact that I never went to uni to be a detriment. It was always one of my big regrets. I never went to uni. I never went to uni. But I wasn't ready to go to uni. I wasn't ready to learn. It would have been a complete waste of time. So it was a good decision to not go. But from the perspective of what we can do, I, I think it's unlimited. And I know. I know for a fact it's unlimited. I often wonder what would have happened to me had I not gone to the hospital that day. Yeah. We'll never know. Yeah. But I had no idea of the fact that I was even sick because I'd never really entered into, it was anything more than just a flu. It was, I've got a headache. I've, I've got the flu, a couple of days rest will sort it out. I never even considered it would be anything more than that. And the power of the mind is so immense, but I think there's a fine line too. I hear stories and um, Samuel McConnell III actually talks about this story when he, uh, presented at Unleash Your Power Within last year in Sydney. He talks about how he was able through positive thinking and diet change and the like, help his mother who was suffering quite significantly from a, a terminal illness. And I truly believe in things like Eastern medicine and the thought processes around what our mind is capable of. It's infinite, but we allow ourselves to restrict it with our beliefs and thank God, quite frankly, for this revolution where people are really starting to question and seriously question what we believe because we're on a fast train to, to nowhere, really. We've yeah. got this polarizing view where we have people that believe that you can do anything and achieve what you wouldn't thought that could be done. I mean, everyone talks about the, you know, the four minute mile, never going to be done, never going to be done, never going to be done. Then all of a sudden it's done. And then a whole series of people do it afterwards. Impossible doesn't mean impossible. It just means it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, exactly. Whereas previously the mindset was that was impossible. Let's just not try. Thank goodness. Now we have entrepreneurs and we have innovators like Elon Musk that go, well, you know what? We just need to find a way. Yeah. Let's just keep trying until we find a way because there is always a way. And that's the shift I think that we really need to have in society. Uh, it's going to be tough while we have these generations that are still really quite active in the, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. And as opposed to these new ways of thinking where it's right, let's find a way, let's just do it, let's just make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I often come back to the purveyors of amazing things like you think of your mozart you think of your Bach, you think of your da vinci you know um when these people used to go and do the things that they used to do they were considered mad yeah. einstein they were all mad if they had have had their way they would have been someone would have tied them to a stake and burned them yeah. because they were so far ahead of their time the people around them weren't really ready to consider what they were saying but imagine if they'd never stepped out and just taking that risk and being who they were. Electricity, who knows when it would have been created. You go back to Pompeii and you see all the viaducts and the technology that the Romans had all the way back then. Yeah. Up and if it wasn't for that. All water systems and stuff that are yeah. just theoretically for the time, like yeah. you, we don't even have a concept and stuff for how we could do that, right? But, but you know, and like I, I see in like, where like I connect with you so much on that message is because 
again, life is supposed to look a certain way, mm -hmm. you know, but like when people look at my life and they're like, and there's always different ways people can critique my life. And I, and I always say that I'm the best beholder of like what's best for me. And just because my life looks so much different than yours doesn't mean that I'm doing anything quote unquote wrong. You know, but like I also realize that like I have absolutely no interest in living like what is kind of the set standard. You know, like mm -hmm. it'll be 11 o'clock at night and I'll throw my snowshoes in the car and I'll go snowshoeing for a couple hours and come back home. Not because like I feel like I have to, but for like there's something inside of me that's just like, you need to go snowshoeing right now for a couple hours and just go do that. Or, you know, waking up early or eating the way that I do or just being a part of so much and so much going on because I feel like we have just capped our human potential at such an astonishingly low threshold that Absolutely. like get a few people, you know, like you referenced like David Goggins, well, his 40% rule. And it's just like, it, it can't be more true. And it's probably more like a 4% rule because we get these people like, you know, again, like, in, like you alluded to Elon Musk. Well, how on earth can you tell me that somebody should only work four hours a day when you have a guy who has five companies that are worth like billions of dollars between SpaceX and Tesla and the boring company. And like, you know, like, like PayPal, like all of these things, like how is that humanly possible living under the standard of what we say is humanly possible? And like, that's the thing, like, we see that there is a difference between like people like Elon Musk and, you know, David Goggins and Einstein, like all these people along the way. But I just really feel like they just connected with such a different reality of what they think human potential really means. Absolutely. Even with like Elon Musk, who used to read two books a day. I'm like, it would take me half or three quarters of the day to read two books. You know, but like, again, like that's where I cap that potential because I immediately assume that I couldn't condition myself to actually make that really easy, but it's mm -hmm. just not something that is the set standard. So it seems impossible or crazy or extra human that somebody else has decided to do these things. And, you know, like, like our limitations are only like what we crave, but again, they become a social standard of what limitations should be and how we should be operating our lives. Absolutely. Instead of asking ourselves um, why it's happening or, oh, how do I get there? How do I do that? Uh, I remember when I decided to start reading a book every two weeks. I used to be an avid reader and then wasn't for years. And then I said, right, every two weeks I'm going to read a book. And then I started realizing that's going to be really, really hard. I had a choice to make. It was either going to be, okay, I need to give myself longer to read these books to not put pressure on myself or I need to understand how to read better. Yeah. So I went with the second option. It was, okay, how do I read better? And I did the, uh, the Quoo reading, speed reading course. I went, right, how do I do this? Because when I was a kid, I used to speed read. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I'd forgotten. And so now I have two different types of reading. I have immersion and I have speed reading. So when I'm reading through a book for the sake of reading through it, I'll speed read through it and I'll make my notes and I'll highlight my pieces that are relevant to me. But I know that I'm not going to absorb absolutely everything to it, but I don't intend to. But then when I want to come back and I want to do immersion reading, I know that I want to take a longer time with it. But that's not my primary focus because my immersion reading is for complete love. Yeah. It's something that I do when I, I really want to enjoy it and I really want to sit back on the, on the deck in the sun and just spend hours with my head in it and instead of looking at that saying well i need to give myself three weeks to read a book because i can't read a book in two i went and looked at the process and said well what can work for me what other options are there and so i came up with those two things that work for me unfortunately in society a lot of people will go well i'll just take three weeks to read the book yeah and that's just limiting ourselves constantly because we will naturally take the easiest route which is why when you get to people who come to coaching they initially start to push back and they, they don't like it. With my clients, I actually say to them, we're going to go to places that are going to be tough and it's possible that you're not going to like it and you're possibly going to want to fight and you're possibly going to want to cry and you're possibly going to want to swear. And all of these things you may show as reactions and they're all perfectly okay. But when you find yourself in this situation of being uncomfortable, I'm always going to bring you back to what do you want to achieve? Yeah. 
And when they align themselves with the end goal, all of a sudden the pain of pushing through this issue is not as big. And they go from looking at me thinking, I am actually going to kill her, I don't want to have this conversation, to, all right, well, let's go there. And then I'll drill further and further and further and further until we get to the point where I say, well, does this meet what you're trying to achieve? And they're comfortable with it. I'll always try and give it a little bit of a nudge if I think there's more. But it's the point of, I don't like to be pushed. I don't like to be told. I don't like to have to answer these questions. I don't like to think things differently because my mindset tells me I just give myself another week to read the book because that's the easy option. And like how much of that, like if you just had to kind of generally like give your opinion, it's like, I find that a lot of people find they will take the three weeks and not the two weeks because they're so busy, you know, but then it's like, you start talking about like the, Oh, what show are you watching right now? Oh, I just binge watch like these five, yeah. six <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, I'm, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, like, you know, like, when do you think we're going to get to a point where like, we kind of stop and we're just like, we waste so much of our lives. And it's not that we then have to like, read a book is not then that we have to start a company but like just realizing like our days and like the society that we kind of live in right now really has taken our time away from us under the facade of kind of giving us time at the same time yeah. like like what do you what are your thoughts behind that i am very passionate about i hate tv I, I don't watch mainstream TV. Uh, I never thought I'd get to that situation. I remember a friend of mine about four years ago telling me, I don't have a TV in my house. And I just looked at him like he was a kind of just completely mad. I said, what, you don't have a TV in your house? How do you manage? He goes really easily actually. <laughs> and back then, four years ago, that didn't resonate with me. I, I had two young children. Uh, the TV was on in the background just for noise. And I'd never thought any differently. Uh, now, I remember when Game of Thrones was out and everybody at work was talking about Game of Thrones and they try and have a conversation with me about it and I'm like, I haven't watched it. It's like, what? You've got to be kidding. You haven't watched it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't watch TV. What do you mean you don't watch TV? Well, I, I, I don't watch TV. And they go, well, put it on your phone. Put Netflix on your phone. I'm like, well, why would I do that? Because I'm listening to podcasts or I'm, I'm dropping into a Facebook Live or why, why would I want to watch TV on the train? And they look at me like I'm crazy. Well, simultaneously, I'm looking at them going, I really wish you'd tap into your potential because this whole binge watching really doesn't serve you. It, it gives you nothing. It, it benefits your life in no possible way other than conversation at work, which is great. That's fine. But it's at the cost of something else. If you can tie it in where it doesn't cost you something else, then great. But inevitably it does end up costing us something else. I, I recall a friend of mine who used to be an immense high achiever. He was naturally gifted, just naturally gifted. And he had a, a, an event at work that he went for a promotion, didn't get it uh, and didn't understand why. And instead of going into understanding why, he let that change his whole being of who he was. So instead of going to the, well, you know what? I didn't get it. I'm going to have a look at what I need to change and go for it next time, or I still have that goal, he completely gave up. So he went from being a high performing, always getting the, the salesman of the year, going on the incentive trips, living the great life, to I don't care, I'm giving up. In six months, you watch, the, you just watch the downfall. And it's, well, what are you doing? It's, it's, you know it's just like, a question. Sorry to cut you off, but like, that's almost like the same thing as like what you faced with your health, right? You yeah. know, we're like, there was just like, you were teetering on a very thin line. Like clearly he was teetering on a very thin line yeah. and didn't recognize it. Right. Cause like, that's pretty like adverse, right. You know, like to be able to go, you know, to that extent. Right. Like, yeah, yeah I just, I find it like, in a, like that again, like how many people are living that, but maybe like a different like version or variation of like that same experience that you had in the hospital. So common. And one of the beautiful things about being involved in social media is I get to talk to people all over the world and I have amazing conversations with people who reach out to me and ask me things like, how do I handle my confidence? You're, you look so confident and you've gone through so much and I, I want to know how to do what you do. And I'll start to talk to them about some of the things that they've experienced and my heart absolutely goes out to them. 
but I'll also get them thinking about, well, is this going to define you? Is this going to be the event that tells you who you are for the rest of your life because things didn't go the way you wanted? We all go through things the way we, we didn't plan to. And I think our biggest problem is that we expect life to be easy. We expect things to be fair. And that's completely wrong. No one should expect life to be fair because there is no fairness. If there were fairness in life, there wouldn't be poverty. If there was fairness in life, there wouldn't be inequality. So we, we trick ourselves all of the time. But I, I really see a lot of this. It's very prevalent in especially Western culture where we want things, but we don't want to work for them. And we think that we should have them. And then when we don't get them, instead of asking, well, what can I do? Or how can I better myself? It's let's throw a tantrum. Yeah. And it's, it's so common and it's getting better. And thank goodness for this whole movement where people are willing to be coached and become more uh, aware of things. Uh, I personally have three coaches and they do very different things for me. And I am very aware of what they all offer me. And my health coach is never going to give me business advice. My mindset coach is never going to tell me about my health. Uh, but these people are all very important to me because I know that they encourage me to lift. And I outgrow them sometimes. I get to a point where it's, well, you know, you've gotten what you need from me. Let's, let's put you onto somebody else. And that's because I want to constantly grow. Mm -hmm. For me, that comes from the fact that I recognize that there is no guarantee of tomorrow. I need to make sure that I live every moment. I don't want something to happen to me like it almost did before and find myself in a hospital wondering, should I, could I? And in fact, in my group that I've got, uh, I've set up a Master Your Potential group. In the, the, or the, the welcome video, I actually say, let's agree to not be those old people sitting in the nursing home wondering what if and if I only had a Let's agree to be those people that are willing to push the limits, that are willing to find out. And if we don't know where to go, we reach out to each other and say, hey, do you know this? Can you find this out for me? Can you give me some info? Let's agree to not settle. And let's agree that today is not supposed to look like tomorrow. The next second is not supposed to look like the one before. But let's also agree that we're going to live in the present moment and be grateful for what we have. While we strive for something better, we're also content with what we've got. And I think that's also a very fine line that we tread because while I personally have my goals and I strive for something immensely better than what I, what I have at the moment, you know, a mission to save 10,000 people from themselves and help them to master their potential is no small goal. Yeah. But I don't do that whilst looking at what I have going, oh, this is rubbish. Yeah. I do that while looking at my current life being very grateful for what I have, feeling immensely blessed for the fact that I'm, I'm able to support my family, that I have a good relationship with people around me, that I have family and friends and support. And I'm lucky enough to be gifted to be able to go out and do something like this. And I don't take that lightly. I consider that to be an immense privilege. Uh, one of the things I'm doing at the moment, and I'm always talking about pushing myself and doing something different, um, I've decided to write a book and it's been in the making for a while. And like with me, there's always things that resonate. And one of the words that's always resonated with me is the word dauntless. And I remember when I mentioned that word for the first time to someone, they, the first response was, what are you, a freak? Well, you know, that just sums me up in this stage of my life so well. And dauntless is not about, I'm not, I'm not scared because fear has a purpose in our life. It's about I identify what my fear is and I work out if I need to keep it. If it's there for my survival and my safety, then I'm grateful for it. But if it's not, it's about, right, let's work out how to get rid of this. Let's work out how to eradicate it out of my life because it's baggage I don't need to carry. And when we're carrying all this additional baggage, what we're doing is we're limiting ourselves. We're allowing ourselves to sit. We're allowing ourselves to be comfortable and be okay. But the risk is we're going to become those people in the nursing home going, you know, I feel wish I would have I really wish I could have and if I had have done this uh, I, I have a good friend of mine he he's in the um, used to be in the um, UK Air Force and he tells amazing stories about World War II and some of the missions that he went on and his one regret his one regret is that he didn't talk to the love of his life oh that I was in my 20s and I should have talked to her and told her that I loved her. He said we were friends and then we got deployed to different places and I never told her. 
He said, and she married and she had kids and she lived a full life. He said, but my whole life I loved her and I never told her. And that for me is just the greatest tragedy. I would much rather go and say it and risk it, no, than, than not. I'd rather go and try that thing and have it not come off the way I think it should and learn from it yeah. than sit there and die wondering. I don't intend to live my life that way. I don't advocate watching life go by because realistically every breath is a gift and when we fundamentally come back to the fact that every breath is a gift instead of not considering it at all it changes every other perspective in your life if you let it yeah see and like that's i i couple that with also like like a lot of like um vedic philosophy you're saying like everything you do from breathing to eating to blinking to reading is all the practice right you know it's just like valuing like each moment like of our lives and really understanding that like we do need to stop restricting ourselves because like essentially that's what he did is he restricted himself being like released from like this angst inside of knowing he should do what he wants to do you know yeah. and but like that's the definition of people you know but like the problem is is that most people don't just have this one thing you know, like they have so many things that like, that's just sitting with like pooling of angst inside them, like wishing they would do this, wishing they had more time. Like, you know, like, oh, I have kids now or like my job or I can't switch my job. Okay, well, my mortgage, like all of these things that they just identify of like preventing them from being able to do those things that when they end up in the nursing home, they don't look back and share with somebody saying, I wish I would have just done this one thing. Like, I would rather do all those things and it forever turn out bad than ever say, well, at least I didn't express one of them. But like, yeah. I wake up every day with that intent of just saying, like, I have my certain structure to my day, but I can't predict today yesterday because today is a completely different day that I can't preconceive what is going to be of value today. Only today can give me that opportunity. And it's really how I've decided to kind of structure my time in my life. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. Like I really love the way that you do that and you just open yourself up to the possibilities, but you've got this foundational element of gratitude, which is so imperative. And it really got lost with this sense of entitlement that we've just decided to wash everything with. I find in my life, since I've decided to be that person that instead of sitting back and wondering that goes and does things, I've had the most amazing experiences I, I wrote a post earlier this year about a man that I met at an event that I was at at New Year's Eve who works for the GSG-9, the German Special Forces. And if I had not gone out of my way and just, I literally just went up to his table. I'd never seen him. I didn't know him. Uh, and I just, I actually just went up to him and I said, hi. And he's, hi. I said, you know what? Forgive me, but there's something different about you. You're different to every other person in this place and I'd really like to know why. And he was a little bit shocked. It's not something that you would expect a person to do. Uh, it's definitely not something that I would normally do, but I saw this as one of those opportunities and I evaluated it by saying to myself, am I going to regret if I don't find out? And the answer was yes. And yeah. as soon as I realised that I'd regret it if I didn't do it, I went and did it. I had nothing to lose. What was the worst that was going to happen? He was going to look at me like I was some kind of crazy and go, well, no, see you later. So what? But because I was bold enough to go and actually ask him, he was happy to give me conversation for hours. And it was amazing. It's an experience I will never forget because he taught me so much about life and about uh, limits and about choices. I mean, this guy was in his 30s and he was elite. You could tell he was absolutely elite and there was just something about him that resonated. But what I found interesting about that was I seemed to be the only one that noticed. Oh. And I said that to him. I said, I find you should be swarmed with people who want to talk to you like I do. And he said, no, you're the only one that's picking up on it. And yeah. that for me was also very interesting because that's all about the energy and about putting out energy for people who are like-minded and because I was aware of my space and because in my life I'm seeking people who, who think like me, who act like me, who have the vision like me, I was automatically attracted to his energy and basically had 
the courage to go up and, and question that and say, tell me about you because obviously there's something that I need to know. And I'm very, very grateful for the fact that I've become that person. And I encourage that with everyone because our fears define us. They limit us so much. Well, I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to go for that job because I might get rejected. So what? Get rejected. Find out why you didn't get the job. Get the feedback and then go and get the skills you need to get it. Why are we so scared of being rejected by something? Why have we created for ourselves such a situation where it's, oh my goodness, I'd be devastated. Well, yeah, you will be, but you'll get over it. Yeah, so let me ask you this, because I think it kind of plays a little bit of a part in it, because you rarely hear anybody talk or use the terminology bold anymore. So like when you said it, it actually really stuck out to me. Do you think that we systematically and most likely unintentionally deconditioned ourselves of being bold, but we were inherently bold before because we had to, because it was survival. Like you had to be bold to survive. So by default, we were bold, but then we aren't now, but now we have to coach ourselves into being bold, which should be something that would be very primal to us, but mm. we're so disconnected with it that it actually now carries the definition of being bold. But before it was just called living. But you yeah, just would wake up and it was just living. But now we've coined a term for something that should just be as natural as breathing. So I've always sense. been yeah, I completely agree. Um I've always been told my whole life that I'm I'm a leader and I'm bold and I'm courageous. I I never understood it, I never believed it. Um, but I remember the first time I actually had someone say that to me, uh, it was a, a guy at a speaking conference. Uh, he was the presenter. I went up after, after the presentation, introduced myself to him, thanked him very much for coming all the way from the U S to do this series for us. And he said to me, your question was amazing. And my natural reaction was, okay, thanks. He said, you don't understand who you are, do you? And I thought, I'm sorry, I, I don't know you. He says, no, you don't need to know me. He says, but I know you. He says, you are bold. And that's the first time I'd ever heard that. And I went, what? Bold? He says, no. He says, you don't realize it yet. He says, but once you work it out, how to use that, he says, you are, you are bound for great things. And I thought, oh, okay, thanks. I didn't know what to do with it, but it's stuck in my mind. And when I started to think about how many times in my life I've had someone use the word bold or influential or create, courageous, it's actually come up quite a few times, or a leader. Um, it's been inherent all the way through from school in my life. But we don't want to take risks anymore. We've allowed our fears to get to such a state in our mind that we don't want to be embarrassed. Oh, I couldn't do that. I'd be so embarrassed. Well, guess what? You'll get over it. Um, oh, I couldn't do that because what if I don't get the job? So what? You don't get the job. Uh, I couldn't do that because... Um, how would I pay for it? Well, Tony Robbins has got a theory called burn the boats. He says, you're always at your best when you have to find a way. Don't create a plan B, find the way. I have it written up on in my bedroom and, and it says, play full out, find the way. And I wake up to that first thing every morning because that's my reminder that no matter what life's going to throw at me today, I always have more to give. I can always find a way. It's about making that active choice to find it. And a lot of us will not make that active choice. Instead of finding a way, we find an excuse. Yeah. And I don't advocate that because finding an excuse is not living. Finding an excuse is never going to get us to the moon. Finding an excuse is never going to allow a Richard Branson to be able to fly a rocket. You know, finding an excuse was never going to be able to allow us to innovate, to create, to influence each other positively. And if we're in a world of excuses, that's not living. That's surviving. Yeah, which is interesting because, you know, like when you talk about like, and again, this is kind of like the same concept with the bold is that if we, if we would have, or if, let me rephrase this. If we were a species where excuses were validated, we would have never become an apex species. Like mm -hmm. we like, because we would have just never have, we would have never have made shelter. We would have never have made the wheel or fire or electricity, like, or any of the things that stemmed long for us because we refused at a certain point that like excuses were valid. And we just, we found the way. But I kind of think that's where like a lot of people are shifting back to when they're, they're being more mindful, they're being more present and grounded and they're finding coaches is because it's like, I actually don't like that I find excuses. 
because mm -hmm. I don't really connect with it because it's not really who I am or how I should represent myself. I don't really know why I feel that way, but I do know that I recognize that this, this is now why I'm here, you know, because yeah. like, it's not really who we are like as people, you know, and it's like, the same way with like poor diet, poor, um, you know, exercise, yeah. routines, you know, like all of these different things, they're just really not who we are fundamentally. And we're not lost because of like, those were lost because, we just, we refuse to believe how much value there is in these things that are just very simple. And it's just, again, taking the time out to listen to your intuition and saying that, no, I don't agree with this. That's okay. And I can stumble through this process because that is also okay. Because that's how I'm going to figure it all out in the long run. We also live in ourselves with age. Uh, I hear it a lot. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. Uh, there's another one that's, well, you know, it's too late to change now. That, that's just complete rubbish in both cases. And I'll give you a case in point. My parents are both in their 70s. And they both have a little bit of weight to lose. They're, they're not the most healthy people on the face of the planet. My mum saw my health journey and the changes that I made from some of the health choices that I made. And it, it, it's, it's no secret that I utilise the Isogenics pro product. Uh, it works for me and I stuck to it. My mum actually started asking me questions about, well, what are you doing? Why do you look so different? Why, why this, why that, why the other? And I said, well, I'm just using this stuff. And for me, it's amazing and I love it. And it's got me where I am and it helps me with the lifestyle I want. And I don't have to worry about my health because I know it's all plant-based. So it ticks a lot of boxes for me and I use it. And it took her about three weeks. Mm -hmm. And she finally asked, well, can I use it? Well, yeah, of course you can use it do you want to use it to lose weight? I said, oh, well, I think it's time. I'm pretty sick of carrying this weight around and I really want to be more healthy and I want to live my life. And yeah, it's time, she says. I went, okay, great. So I got my 72-year-old mother on work and she is now walking every day. She uses her fitness tracker to do her 15,000 steps every day. Now, this is a woman that barely would get 6,000 steps. Because well, she even has like fifteen thousand, like that's a lot of steps just in general, right? Absolutely. Because I have worked with her to train her to understand that ten thousand is the minimum. Ten thousand is for health. It's not for weight loss. Yeah. So she kind of has the Muhammad Ali theory with it now, which is the first ten thousand don't count. Yeah. And the next five thousand are the ones that where I get the benefit. So she aims for the fifteen. Yeah. And her mindset shift has been enormous. She gets people complimenting her now. She stands taller. She smiles more. She's more positive in the aspects of her life. She speaks differently. She feels better. She sleeps better. So she's got all these on-flow effects that are really positive for her. But she didn't prescribe to the, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Instead, she chose to break from the mold of what all her friends are. And most of her friends are overweight. She chose to be the one that stepped out and said, I've had enough of this. I don't want to keep this in my life. It's going, what do I need to do? And she's made the changes. She has had to try so many new things. I mean, she cleanses for 48 hours. She gets a headache on day two and it doesn't go away, but she sticks with it because she knows is where day two is where she gets the benefits. She knows what the goal is and she's committed to the goal. And so she knows that a little bit of a headache is not that big deal of price to pay and she's willing to pay it. Yeah. So she has changed her mindset at 72 years old because she doesn't prescribe to what the world tells her. Honey, this is your life now. You've made your choices. Good luck with that. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you something um, uh, that's really prevalent in my life. And I kind of feel like everybody that I naturally run into, it, it's a theme in there. There's how much do you value health and fitness in, in your life? Cause like, obviously you're in great shape and you take care of yourself. So like, um, like wh where do you put like, like, diet nutrition exercise like the whole thing like where's the priority of that like in your life okay so to give you a bit of an insight into me i drink three liters of water a day i have been for quite a long time my body's so attuned to it now that if i drink anything under three i'm dehydrated so i've got my water beside me now i haven't had any for two hours <laughs> i've been drinking water the whole time no, yeah, yeah. Water. <laughs> but um three liters of water a day for me uh, the health benefits of that are amazing. It flushes out your system. It's great for your skin. Um, I'm 44 now, so obviously my skin is becoming more and more something that I want to take care of. So water is a very important part of that. And you um, don't look 44 that, like at all. I would admit. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but also, it's another one of those things. It is what it is. Um, 
people have this it's completely irrelevant i just mean in like yeah absolutely like i yeah to me like i want to be 80 acting 20 so i don't really care totally and i say to people age is just an indication of how long you've been breathing on this planet yeah oh yeah Yeah. that's really all it is it doesn't indicate your maturity it doesn't indicate your looks it doesn't indicate your success really it just says how long you've been breathing for that's it yeah wow we get so caught up in it Health-wise, uh, I do my exercise every day, and I've got different types of exercise I do. I recently just got back into the gym, into my cycle classes. I'm at my absolute best when I'm being flogged. So I'm that person that, as an ex-gym instructor and ex-CrossFit coach as well, I go for the extreme. I struggle to go for the lesser types like the yoga and the Pilates because, for me, I don't like the gentle exercise. I like the flat out, I'm going to absolutely annihilate myself and take half an hour to get back to normal. Uh, That's my preference. It always has been. But I back it up with a toning program because I know that some days I can't get for that full on um, exercise with the the cardiovascular, but I make sure I keep my toning. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that when I was a kid, I used to do gymnastics. So we used to start off with 250 sit-ups every session. Um, I have a fantastic foundation for my core, which I am very grateful for after having two kids, which I've been able to maintain, but my health and my wellness is, is critical to me. And I think an element of that for me is also my spiritual wellness, because if I am physically healthy and I am emotionally well, but I am spiritually void, the spiritual completely overrides everything else. It doesn't matter how healthy I am in every other aspect of my life. If I have void in my spiritual life, it just completely ruins it. So for me, my spirituality is very, very important as well. And I balance all of that out. Yeah. Like when you're coaching people, do you, do you bring them around to like, like health, uh, fitness and like spirituality? Like, do you, do you incorporate, you know, all those facets in there? Or like, like where, where do you draw the line? Do you draw any line? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that uh, I have clients that will come to me that are Christian clients. And if I have a Christian client, we will have a Christian coaching session, which means we'll start off with prayer and then we'll go into a normal coaching session and we may or may not end with that. But there'll be Christian reflections throughout the session. I just as easily don't do that because a lot of what we believe in this day and age for me fundamentally has a lot of biblical truth in it anyway. So I can talk about things without giving them a biblical reference that are generally understood in this day and age anyway. Uh, I, I consider myself very lucky in that respect that I can bring both of those elements, either bringing it in or leaving it out of my coaching session. I've coached people that are completely different religions to me and I firmly believe in tolerance I also firmly believe that there is no, I don't have a right to tell a person that I'm right. Yeah. So what I, I choose like to believe. Like acceptance. Like, and that's, Absolutely. that's what I value yes. a lot of what you've said in regards to like your faith is that like acceptance seems like it's quite high on your scale of values. Absolutely. And I have no right to tell somebody else what they should or shouldn't do. We all have free will and we all have the right to exert it. We're all given that. And I don't consider myself to be in a position where I can tell anyone except maybe my children uh, what to do. And I never would. Uh, People ask me for information or advice. I'm very happy to give it, but I will never solicit it. I will never give it to someone without requesting if it's okay. Even in my sessions, I'll ask, um, can I give you my opinion on that? And it will never be a Christian-based opinion unless I'm having a specifically defined Christian session. Otherwise, that gets completely left to the side. I find that people ask me about that sort of thing if they're interested in it or they want to know kind of how it affects my life. And I'm I'm more than happy to discuss it openly because it is such a core element of who I am and it's something that I make active choices around every day. Um, I mean, I go to church every week. I have a a Sabbath every week where I take a day off and I rest and I spend time with family and church members and give myself recharge time. That's how I choose to live my life. That's the best thing for me. I don't go and tell people that's what they should do. However, if they're interested and they ask, I'm more than happy to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I unfortunately going to have to wrap things up here, but I just, I would hope that uh, we could do this again because I just have like so much more that I want to be able to like discuss with you. And I just feel like you're such a, an incredibly interesting person to be able to, to talk to. So um, maybe we could do it again in, in the future sometime. That sounds like a great idea. I appreciate your time, Blake.
Yeah. Uh, can you just at the end, you're just kind of like, you know, throw all your like social media stuff out there, you know, like any websites, URLs, like just any information for people to be able to get a hold of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can get me on Facebook under Joe Jackson. Uh, you can get me on Instagram on my inner M M Y underscore inner underscore M, which is my business name. And you can also get me on website, which is myinnerm.co. Oh, C-O, right? Yes, C-O. Yeah. Yeah, we're as well used to like dot com like over here. So I just wanted to make sure to clarify it was dot C-O. C-O, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, I really appreciate you coming on today. All right. Thanks, Blake.